Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. We're really happy to have you here, 2020, 2021 graduates, family, and friends. And I'm honored to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Luana Araujo. She is also a graduate of the MPH class of 2020. So we're especially lucky to have her here today. <laughs> Dr. Ararujo is an infectious disease specialist and voice for public health. She's an outspoken defender of science in her home country of Brazil, where she regularly appears on social media and news outlets to share impartial, informed updates on COVID-19, vaccines, and public health measures to combat misinformation and confusion. She also serves as a big data and public policy analyst for a major health system in Brazil. I'll now th turn things over to Dr. Ararujo, who will introduce you to our alumni panelists, who were honored with Johns Hopkins Alumni Association Awards earlier today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for our panelists. Um, I will introduce you to the panelists, but first I would like to take a moment just to acknowledge the power of this female panel here today. It's an honor for me to be part of that and should be an honor for all of you to witness this kind of situation. So congratulations to all of you. So um, introducing the panelists, we have uh, Dr. Marigakis, uh, which is, uh, who is an MD, 98, uh, MPH 07, a professor of medicine and Epi epidemiology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she is also senior director of in infection prevention, which touches my heart, <laughs> executive director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit and incident commander for the Johns Hopkins Medicine COVID-19 response. Her research interests are the epidemiology, prevention and control of healthcare acquired infections and antimicrobial resistant organisms. And she serves as co-chair of the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee. Um, next to her, we have Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, Dr. PH from uh, 14 cohort. Uh, Dr. Nuzzo is an epidemiologist and researcher at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic response, sharing her expertise widely and regularly. She was recently named the inaugural director of the Pandemic Center at the Brown University School of Public Health and was formerly a senior scholar at the Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Nuzzo is also a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations and director of the Outbreak Observatory. And next to her, we have Ms. Lois Pace, an MPH from 05, um, Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs in the Department of Health and Human Services. Ms. Pace is responsible for setting priorities and policies that promote American public health agencies and interests worldwide. She executes global health diplomacy with foreign governments, international institutions, and policymaking bodies, including the G7, G20, United Nations General Assembly, and World Health uh, Assembly. In her role, Ms. Pace also has testified before Congress, something I can relate to at some point, um, joined President Biden at the 2021 Global COVID-19 Summit and represented the administration in the media to explain key global health strategies and challenges. So, with no further ado, I'm going to start with what we had in mind before the pandemic broke out, okay? We can't say it was a surprise that the pandemic happened, but we clearly failed in anticipating when that would happen and how adequate, adequately prepared we were to deal with it. We all know that successful leadership is built out of, among other aspects, profound knowledge of your resources, coordinated efforts, and transparent, compelling communication. When we think of leadership throughout a global health disaster, that also involves dealing with a globalized world where any kind of information is shared within a blink of an eye. So, Dr. Nuzzo, where were we in that sense, in terms of pandemic preparedness, and what were the challenges you anticipated you would face as a leader? Were your predictions accurate? Um, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to the school. It's really great to be back and to see everyone and to just be inspired by everyone else's careers and contributions. It's um, truly an extraordinary place. And if there are any current students here, um, really, um, it's such a privilege to, to, to be in this building and to train here and to have this network of um, graduates um, from Johns Hopkins that you will call upon at multiple points of your career. 
um, you know, at no other point, I think, has public health been more essential to just living and living our lives and, 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 um, and just managing in the world that we face. And I think COVID-19 has been an unfortunate, stark reminder of that. So if it's hard to remember what's transpired since um, early 2020, but at the very beginning, we heard about this um, outbreak that was happening in China. And it's not uncommon to hear about outbreaks that happen in some part of the world that initially you don't have a lot of information about. There's some aspects of it that may be concerning, but you don't have enough information to know. And I think that's really one of the challenges. And um, you know, initially, I think it was very unclear where this um, situation was headed and whether it was going to be um, the crisis that it has become or whether it was going to be like many of the other events that have happened before, something that um, you know, goes away and most people never hear about it. Um, you know, I think relatively quickly, we started to get a sense that this was something fairly serious. And for me personally, when I started hearing about cases in other countries um, that didn't really have a clear epidemiologic link and that there was evidence that they were spreading it to others and spreading it to others, not say in, 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 the, in the form, you know, um, as a result of caring for a very sick patient or having very um, you know, intense contact. As soon as we knew that this was a new respiratory pathogen that um, we didn't have immunity to in the population that could be spread between people and um, potentially in the community. I think for me, that's when I thought this is a pandemic. This is, you know, it hadn't yet turned up in all corners of the globe, but just uh, it, I expected it would turn up in all corners of the globe because respiratory pathogens are very difficult to slow down and, and to stop. Um, someone once reminded me, um, that at the start, the person asked me, do you think we could experience a million deaths in the United States? And apparently I had answered yes. I was a bit surprised by my, that I had answered that at the time, in part because, you know, if you flash forward a year later, we had truly a miracle of science. You know, decades of prior research paid off such that we developed multiple safe and effective vaccines that could largely take off the table the virus's ability to um, put people in the hospital or kill them. And, um, you know, we had been living with the reality of having vaccines so much that when I heard that I had made that prediction, it was, it was sort of um, surprising to me, in part because it shouldn't have happened. And it did. And so I think it's important to sort of reflect on why that happened. I mean, um, you know, we uh, got really, really fortunate that the science worked in our favor to have these tools that could prevent that from happening. Clearly, there was a lot of deaths experienced in that first year. And in terms of what happened then, I mean, I was deeply troubled by um, how poorly managed the situation was in multiple countries around the world, including here in the United States. Um, one of the projects I run is the Global Health Security Index, and we look at countries' capacities to respond to events like this. And the United States um, scored the highest in part because we have the most resources um, devoted to pandemic preparedness. Um, we didn't have everything, and we actually had some crucial shortcomings, but we had a lot. And to see over that first year of the pandemic, our political leaders sort of actively choosing not to use what we had and to instead pursue totally bogus, non-science-based alternative strategies was just utterly like demoralizing and, and surprising to me. But I think I'm ultimately perhaps even more troubled by what has happened since the development of vaccines and the fact that we have so many people who have not yet been convinced of the values that vaccines provide. And um, you know, I have spent a tremendous amount of time over the past two years talking to all sorts of groups and people about the importance of vaccines, about COVID, all sorts of things. And I've learned a lot in those conversations. Um, and perhaps one of the things that I've learned um, is how utterly ubiquitous um, the disinformation campaigns are. It's like nothing I have seen at any other point in my career in terms of how common the false beliefs are, how common the lies are, and how utterly affected by it people are. And the fact that they're asking me questions mean they are actually seeking information. So they're 
they're not, um, you know, just totally resistant to receiving the right information. It's just that in trying to do their own research, they have um, basically done so in an information environment that's been poisoned by lies. For me, one of the most salient kind of moments was when a um, very kind of top leader in, in DC asked me a question um, that was clearly driven by misinformation. And he wasn't someone who I would have assumed was in a position to know right away that that was not true. Um, but he asked it in all sincerity. And I thought, if this individual can't see that this is not a correct thing, if he was unable to kind of take you know, the steps necessary to, to re realize why this was not true, if he, if he too, having had a government service career, could believe that um, a government agency would do the things he was asking me um, about, uh, and he didn't have that kind of trust um, in, in the government, then I thought, you know, so how can we ask you know, what, what do we expect of everybody else? So that has been a really, um, I would say, um, uh, challenging and, and demoralizing aspect of all of this. Um, but I don't let it um, turn me off or make me completely pessimistic because as many of these horrible, difficult conversations we've had, I've also seen people change. And when they connect with you and you spend the time with them and you really kind of take the effort, I have seen people move to a different place. And so it, to me, it just underscores the importance of not giving up and don't turn your back on people, continue to commit yourself to a life of service in this field, um, because you can make important changes. It's just going to be, you know, perhaps a little slower and maybe a little bit more incremental, but with the 27,000 alumni of this, um, of this school, uh, that can add up to, to a tremendous amount. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, we share a lot of um, difficulties throughout the world, that's, that's for sure. And it's uh, at the same time um, reassuring to hear you talk about that and to hear you expose this kind of thing as much as we were facing it down there. But anyway, um, Dr. Maragakis, um, Johns Hopkins ecosystem is not only of major national health importance, but an international hub of professionals and a vital educational center. Everything that you do here echoes directly in other medical centers in the world, and I can attest that in my country. How do you analyze its performance during these difficult years and how challenging it was to lead the transition from the regular daily health service provision to a pandemic response? Thank, thank you for that question, and I, I will add um, that I'm really honored to be included in this panel, and I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues. And, and for all of you to, to be here as well. Um, you know, representing, uh, I, I think that Dr. Nuzzo's comments are so important and, and you'll hear threads of that in, in my comments as well. When I look at the healthcare um, infrastructure and the broader Johns Hopkins um, medicine and Johns Hopkins University, our, our organization I think has performed extraordinarily well um, during this crisis. And so I'm very proud of what Johns Hopkins has done in terms of our own response in keeping our own personnel and our students and our patients safe, but also the incredible outreach to the community, which is really what, what we're here to do. And so I feel like that part of the mission of our organization really came through in our pandemic response. And unfortunately, due to some of the things that Dr. Nuzzo just outlined, um, we were thrust into that position in a way that we, um, I don't think could ever have imagined um, that we would need to, to be because of the, the vacuum, uh, so to speak, of, of leadership um, in other realms, the political um, uh, leadership or lack thereof, some of the, the faltering um, that, that was going on in our nation and the world. Uh, and so I do think that Johns Hopkins um, uh, really um, was an incredibly important resource for the world. Um, one thing that was very visible and very prominent was providing data and, and that data dashboard, I hope all of you saw, and it was really uh, very prominently used, I think the, the world over and by news organizations and such a, such a wonderful example of epidemiology and just the very basics of data collection and dissemination and the use of data 
um, for uh, driving change and, and informing um, everyone about where the risks were, the, the magnitude of the risks. Um, and that's um, such an essential thing, a, a point of light, a point of truth that can help in the darkness of all that misinformation and confusion and fear uh, that, that was going on. And of course, sometimes the, the numbers themselves caused fear, but um, still good to know what's going on. Um, you know, one thing I would also point to is some of the early conversations about what is the mortality rate? And, and from the very earliest days of 2020, we heard some efforts to kind of minimize um, the impact that this virus was going to have on, on populations and focusing in on mortality rate and saying it's, it's only 1%. Well, 1% is, is high when you have a virus like this. And we have learned this now um, over the last two and a half years when you see a virus that's this ubiquitous and really is going to find everyone eventually um, one percent is is not something that that we can um, take lightly. Um, so I, I think that our um, data platform uh, was incredibly valuable, continues to be very, very valuable. The other thing I would um, that I would say is, um, as your question implied, you know we we have a, a vast uh, infrastructure of providing health care. Uh, to our local community, but also as a, um, a nationwide and a, and a worldwide resource for uh, research and patient care, uh, as well as an educational role. And um, pivoting, I think, was, was extraordinarily difficult, but I do think that we did it well, uh, in large part because of our prior experiences and preparation. Um, one of the things uh, was our biocontainment unit that we do have across the street in the Johns Hopkins Hospital that uh, was built and put into place during um, the 2014 uh, crisis of Ebola in West Africa. And um, it is a physical space, a unit where um, isolation for highly uh, contagious diseases uh, can occur, treatment and isolation to contain um, a dangerous pathogen while caring for that patient in, a, in an area separate from our normal clinical operations. But the perhaps more important part of that is a dedicated team of uh, nurses and doctors, respiratory therapists, um, lab, uh, laboratorians that um, come together and train on a regular basis to um, wear the personal protective equipment properly, do the cleaning and disinfection properly, and um, transportation of lab specimens. So we had drilled all of these um, concepts, developed protocols, practiced, and, and really formed a cohesive team uh, that served us very well when faced um, with, with this pandemic. You can imagine that that team, of course, was not big enough, um, but it became a, a source of strength and knowledge, I think, for our organization to be able to disseminate um, all, all of that confidence that the team had in, in um, knowing that we had protocols and procedures, that we had this knowledge. Um, one of my re regrets actually is that we hadn't gotten further along in, in developing a kind of spoke and, and wheel um, model where, whereby that core group would disseminate the knowledge to people throughout our hospitals and our health systems. Um, and even, uh, you know, across our region, uh, because we are a, a six state region um, resource. Um, so we're, we're continuing to work on that for education and outreach and really um, helping all healthcare providers to understand that their role in a response um, to, to something like this. Uh, but I still think that the work that we had done laid the groundwork um, to, to be able to respond um, extraordinarily well. Um, you know, we could talk a, a lot, I think, about the way that pathogens are transmitted and, and the debate over airborne, whether this virus and to what extent it is um, spread by the airborne route. Um, we did follow the Centers for Disease Control uh, and, and Prevention recommendations from the earliest days to treat it as if airborne spread was possible. And so our facilities teams were able to trans um, really modify our uh, clinical spaces for the air handling um, in order to keep our personnel and our other patients safe so that we could continue normal operations while still caring for a large number of patients with a potentially airborne transmitted um, viral disease. 
So these are some of the examples um, of, I, I think, the way that we were positioned um, to respond well. Um, I know everyone's aware of the supply chain issues that are now hitting every aspect of our life, whether it's um, you know, your things at the grocery store or trying to buy a car or electronics or anything. But in those early days, um, it was really quite terrifying to have the personal protective equipment in such short supply. And I do remember sitting in the command center just realizing not only the, the gravity of the threat that we were facing, but just the unimaginable situation of facing that threat without personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. without disinfectant, without hand sanitizer. Um, and it's still unbelievable to me that that situation happened. I, I don't know enough about supply chain to understand truly why it happened, um, but I do think going forward it's something that um, our country and, and the world really needs to address so that we're ready to pivot in a way that I expected. I, I kind of understood that it would last for a short period of time, but it lasted for mm -hmm. much longer than I ever would have expected. Um, certainly, we were very grateful to community partners who stepped forward. Um, and um, some of uh, my favorite example is the hand sanitizer that did arrive from a, a local distillery <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. um, just turned their operation over so that they were distilling hand sanitizer for us in, instead of whiskey, which is lovely. And the bottle was a uh, keepsake, I guess, <laughs> from our experience. But, um, and the other thing I, I wanted to, to talk about because of the, the leadership that our organization needed to provide, and we didn't do this alone by, by any means, but, um, but I think because of some of the failures of, of leadership on the national level and and, and in some cases, I guess the global level, but um, the need to really partner with other academic medical centers in our area, with um, public health officials in our area, and really um, go beyond our patients, our employees, our students, which was enough of a, of a challenge, but thinking about the community and really um, implementing public health measures um, on a scale that, that we had never done in terms of a vaccine campaign when we were fortunate enough to have a vaccine, but even earlier than that to implement testing. And Johns Hopkins was one of the first uh, places in our region to have a test that was available and to even be able to diagnose someone uh, as having COVID-19. Um, so these are some of the examples of things that I think went very well and some of the lessons that I take out of this, the importance of those public-private partnerships um, and, um, and the final thing I'll mention, uh, there's so many things to talk about, but um, related to that idea of reaching out and protecting the community, it's so incredibly important to think about the most vulnerable populations because we knew from the beginning uh, that there was a disproportionate effect on um, communities of color, on um, those who had lower uh, socioeconomic status, lower ability to work from home, uh, and, and just so many factors that were converging to make them more vulnerable to the severe effects, whether it was underlying comorbidities, whether it was not being able to, um, to work from home, um, not having access to information or um, testing, um, or ability to isolate from other members of their family or the community. So uh, a lot of the work that we did um, was in this regard. I think it wasn't enough and it needs to continue. Uh, but I felt like it was also very eye-opening and dovetails so nicely with all the other work that our organization does to try to address health disparities and, um, and work with the community. So um, I guess uh, my final comment about it um, before we move on is, is just looking at history. And um, you've probably studied um, here, as we all did, other um, pandemics, uh, other situations of, out of big outbreaks. Um, and even though I had done that, um, there's nothing like living through it. Um, but, but during the pandemic, one thing I did was go back and read about the 1918 flu pandemic. It's very instructive, and if you haven't read uh, a book about it, I, I would suggest that you do that and then reflect on some of these themes that we're talking about today, uh, because what's most striking when you do that is the similarities. And, and so I think what comes out is 
much of this is about human nature and we can do as much as we possibly can think of from a medical standpoint or a scientific standpoint um, to prepare for a pandemic but uh, we really will not be successful i don't think until we also partner with colleagues in sociology psychology history political science and really get a comprehensive sort of approach to some of these daunting problems that arise and um, as frustrating as it is to see our own country um, reacting in this way, um, I think there's something in human nature and, and our um, societies that, that lends itself to these kinds of things, the anger, the rebellion, the, the, the kinds of things that we're seeing. Um, and we need a better way to be ready for that and, and to counteract it. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. And uh, actually, if you look back to the 1918 pandemic, you will also learn a lot about the long term effects yeah. of that situation. And this is something that we're still trying to understand how to deal with. We're just at the beginning of this situation. So um, we still have a lot to learn from. I also want to acknowledge two things. First, we had a lot of volunteers here uh, from the MPH cohort who worked at that time um, building face masks. Mm -hmm and organizing uh, the phone information and a lot of different things. I remember that. So um, I thank you all for doing that. I was sick at the time. I wasn't able to do that, but I remember that clearly. Uh, it was a, a beautiful movement from all of us to try to do something to help you all. Um, and also, if you allow me, I just want to say some few words in Portuguese because I'm receiving a lot of messages from Brazil that mm. people are watching this panel. So, muito obrigada a todo mundo que está assistindo esse painel do Brasil. É uma alegria ter vocês aqui. Um, so, Ms. Pace, yeah. <laughs> as someone who worked directly with international institutions in different countries during the pandemic, I can attest to the extreme dependence of global health from external resources and coordination. Mm -hmm. Can you please describe to us the major challenges you faced concerning leading the U.S. international health diplomacy while trying to protect national interests? Hmm. Hmm. I can try. <laughs> well, they put me here. I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, not fault I'm not faulting the messenger here. Um, so I appreciate that question. And I just have to, to say I'm also just really honored to be sharing the stage with fabulous women, including our our dear moderator who can tell her own story um, of, of how she's championed uh, this issue over time. I, of course, have only been in my current position for the last uh, 15 months or so. Um, and so it was actually interesting stepping into this role, having worked outside of it, right, outside of government for the first part of the pandemic and then mm -hmm. on the other side of the fence, right, as someone who people are then asking these questions to. Uh, I, um, you know, the, the way I, I, I guess I'll frame a response to that question is threefold. One is really starting with humility and recognizing what's already been discussed, that the U.S. didn't get this all the way right. <laughs> and so in that way, I felt a sense of uh, common ground with the rest of the world, and I felt it was really important. And I think this administration has, has really echoed this, right? We are trying to show up with that sense of humility and the understanding that we have a lot to learn ourselves and ideally we can learn that from our global partners it's one of the reasons why on day one the president said okay no we, we really are showing up at who and we're, <laughs> we're sending our best uh, to work with them and to work with other global partners so that's that's critical and i think number two um another obvious sort of focus area for us was this question of equity and it was about equity at home but it's also been about equity abroad. And I won't say that we've gotten that completely right either. And I think we can have a fulsome conversation about that, but it was at least my intention. And I think this administration's goal to ensure that we weren't just focused on our own national interests, or at least that we were seeing sort of international progress in our national interest, if that makes sense, right? I mean, what's, and then people talk about that in different ways. People talk about that from a security standpoint to say, you know, no one's safe until everyone's safe, but there are also very important social aspects to that, mm -hmm. right? And and so it's, it, you know, let alone just the moral argument that we really are all in this together. But regardless of how we're approaching this, the fact is we can't outpace people in other parts of the world in terms of the progress we make, make on COVID. And we've seen that. We've seen that with the emergence of variants. We've seen that 
um, just in so many other areas when it comes to how this virus has evolved. And so, um, you know, I was really pleased to, to step into this role and to be, and to recognize or realize that when I arrived in March of last year, these conversations were happening already about how we could share with the world, how we could support institutions like COVAX. Again, perhaps imperfect systems, but they were designed to meet this need and to work in this way. And then even beyond contributing to a COVAX or a WHO, even beyond sharing with different vaccines with different parts of the world, a commitment to invest in medium or long-term capacity in this space. So in other words, what does it look like for India, South Africa, Brazil, to be able to manufacture and distribute these products at a national or regional level? So that's that's been the you know one other piece of this, the equity piece. I think the other part of how I think we show up in the world or need to show up in the world is really thinking about our accountability, right? What do we do in this moment and what do we do beyond this moment should goodness forbid we end up in this situation again? Because, you know, we, we did have a plan, right? And it wasn't just the US who had a plan. I mean, the world had a plan, mm -hmm. supposedly, to, to, <laughs> to deal with pandemics. And I wanna give credit to a lot of parts you know, a lot of countries who did get this right, and, and I think we've those have been lifted up, and I'm sure that you all have studied that here, and, you know, we've all read about these situations where, against all odds, and even without the, you know, traditional leaders like the U.S. or, you know, other countries in the global north, there were, there were plenty of other countries who really showed their leadership and really showed the capacity that they, frankly, already had um, and, and really could continue to build on throughout this crisis. But the reality is the you know if, if we were to give the world a grade it wouldn't be that high right it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have matched what you know people like dr nuzo said we were ready to do so it's on us governments worldwide to come together and really ask ourselves okay well what went wrong and where and how can we fix it and this is why you have you know i was just in geneva a couple of weeks ago talking about how we improve the international health regulations um, we also were, you know, up at 3 and 4 a.m. this past week. I don't even know what day it is, but <laughs> talking about other ways we can make improvements, right? People have probably heard about these, um, the deliberations around what could become a pandemic accords, right? So building on what we have in place. Again, what more can we do beyond a proclamation or declaration, but really what commitments can we make mm -hmm. to solving this problem, preventing this problem in the future, whether it's around, you know, sharing um, innovations at a, more equitable sort of rapid pace, or you know, looking at this uh, not just as a human health problem, but as you were saying, sort of beyond the health sector. You know, looking even at just uh, animal health, planetary health. You know, what are the intersections of what we're talking about? And beyond all that, just ensuring that there is a healthier ecosystem that can respond to crisis that's more resilient in the in the wake of crisis. But that's that's how we're you know we're, we're thinking about um, our responsibility in this space um, and you know again sure um, that serves the U.S. but ideally it's serving the world as well. Um, may I compliment the question then? Sure. Um, we are going through a different. It's not a public health crisis, but a different challenge now, which is the monkeypox. Mm. Um, do you think that we learned something from the um, COVID nineteen pandemic? that we're actually using right now to fight that? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, it's, it's evidenced by um, the fact that during the World Health Assembly that I just referenced, you know, and that, and that just took place a couple of weeks ago, there were not just sidebar conversations, but actually, um, you know, sort of ad hoc briefings stood up um, there where member states could come together and say, wait, what are we hearing? What are we seeing, right? So I think that was even just showing the responsiveness of institutions like WHO, mm -hmm. but also governments really saying, okay, well, let's let's have these conversations. That was also on the heels of a G7 health ministers meeting um, where monkeypox was also part of the conversation as was, you know, we, we forget there's been a, you know, viral hepatitis mm -hmm. among children, right? I mean, there's just been other things popping up where I've noticed that we're all, mm -hmm sort of learning real time mm -hmm. from COVID and trying to make sure that we're, we're remembering, you know, <laughs> sort of these immediate lessons. Um, and it's important because you take something like monkeypox, which does feel scary, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, the you know, I, I hate to talk about anything as, a, as beneficial, but, you know, we, we have, we, we've known what monkeypox is, we've dealt with it before, 
you know, we've been tested in this regard. And so I think that is somewhat helpful. Um, but we're also, we're also mindful that this can run away from us in terms of mis and disinformation, mm -hmm. right? Particularly when we, when we look at the communities that are being affected, largely affected, we have to be very careful there. We also have to keep in mind this question uh, of equity because there are countries where monkeypox is endemic and they're sitting around time. saying, well, you know, we've been living with this a long time, but people haven't been this mobilized before, right? So believe me, this is part of this is part of what I'm saying. This is part of our discussions. And that's important because we 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 are trying to learn from COVID-19, let alone really just looking logistically at like the products we have in place, right? Mm -hmm. What are the vaccines? What are the treatments and, and tests? And where are they? Right? Like not just about availability, but accessibility. So I can appreciate that question and frankly you know, welcome input from others as to how we can ensure we are demonstrating that we're, we're not going to repeat the same mistakes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Trying, doing our um, best. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I feel, I feel safer. Um, I'm kidding. Um, um, Dr. Maragak, um, Dr. Nuzzo talked to us a little bit about the impact of false information. Uh, we all felt that in all different sectors that we can imagine. And I'm pretty sure that at some point, Hopkins also felt that. So I ask you, what was the impact of false information within these walls? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's been tremendous. Um, you know, and I have, have learned a lot, as I mentioned, um, we have all learned a lot about the challenges of um, influencing people to do what on the surface sounds like a very simple um, thing like wearing a mask or getting a vaccine um, or changing your behavior in in some way you know i i think that um, one of the biggest challenges was that everything and it continues to be everything tends to be framed as a dichotomy we're either <laughs> locked down or we're opened up and I have been frustrated from the beginning that we can't talk about it as a continuum. Um, and also as a, we're open, but we are modifying what we're doing in a common sense science evidence-based um, driven way. Um, because that's, that was my lived experience. I didn't go home. I, I was in the hospital the whole time. And yet we were distancing and then we put on our masks and you know we were still there. And of course the healthcare providers were taking care, they were, putting themselves in the highest risk situation of taking care of patients who were known to have the virus. So I've just been puzzled the whole time why we can't apply that same logic to things outside, uh, you know, and figure out how businesses can go forward and life can go forward in a modified way. Um, early on, I, 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 I've always felt as an infectious disease physician that um, my job would be easier and we would all be safer if we could see microorganisms. Mm. Um, because it's just so frustrating that people, you know. Well, we share the same. Thing. <laughs> I also had the whole. It's thing. you know that you don't understand, you know, what's on your hands and how how they're transmitted, and um, and it made me think that if there was um, well around the, the same time uh, of the beginning of the pandemic, there were the the murder hornets. Do you remember yeah. the murder yes. hornets? <laughs> and I felt like if the murder hornets, uh, you know, had been so ubiquitous, like the virus, that people would have responded differently um, if the consequence was so visible and painful of walking out your front door and being stung by murder hornets, then people would have worn the protective equipment and thought about carefully, you know, where they needed to go and why and, and, and what to do. So I think this, this is one of the, the major frustrations, but to your question, you know, the disinformation has felt like a, just a, overwhelming pressure or, or a wave that threatened to drown us in everything that we did. And that was whether we were dealing with the community, um, dealing with our patients or our own personnel. Um, and it's, it's just incredibly frustrating and sad. I think it's tragic because people have died because of it. It's true. Um, Dr. Nuzzo, um, all of that still impact us a lot and it seems that it will have a long-term impact not only concerning COVID-19 pandemic which is far from being uh, solved but also in uh, dealing with other public health crises so uh, I will ask you a very easy question 
what's the, what's the answer to all of that? How can we change <laughs> this? I mean, you know, this is the, yeah. the $1 million question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I have to say my biggest fear is that as exhausted as we are about COVID and ready to move on, I mean, everybody is just feels really frustrated. It's been a hot, tough several years um, that there may be this temptation to think, well, that was bad. Glad we don't have to do that for another 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that the data screams at us that the events that make us worried about future pandemics are increasing in frequency. Mm -hmm. So pandemic threats are we should consider them the hazards of our times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just like if, if you're in a hurricane prone state and you live through a hurricane, you don't assume that you'll never have another hurricane. Um, similar, I think, with, with pandemic threats. So we have to fix this. We cannot um, have a situation where we fight these false dichotomies where you either just let it burn or you do nothing. We have to equip people with tools to be able to live their lives but to do so more safely um with the gonna you know with the increasing frequency of, of these types of events i think crucial to that is trust and building trust and engaging with people and to do so directly and i will tell you one thing that i heard so frequently in the conversations at this point i've probably talked to thousands of people about this virus and, and the vaccine and so frequently people say, you know, we just don't know who to trust. And I'd often say to them, well, do you think you could talk to your healthcare provider? Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter if it was the United States or, you know, even other countries. Um, it was very frequent that I would hear, I don't have one. So if public health isn't in people's day-to-day -day lives, if healthcare is not in people's day-to-day -day lives, I think it's really hard for us to show up in emergency and, and all that we do is tell them, you can't leave your house, you have to wear a mask, take this vaccine, trust us, it's, it's gonna help you. So I think we have to fix that. We have to fix the relationships that we have. That said, we have a global misinformation problem. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it is not, fair to put it all on the backs of the medical and public health community to fix. We can't risk communicate our way out of what is essentially informational warfare, sometimes being waged by foreign countries for the purposes of sowing uh, chaos and to, to undermine trust in authorities. And we have a situation where we have a global information environment that is powered by a few American companies. We have to fix the problem that gets that that we are in where well intentioned people who are just trying to get information to live their lives seek out that information and literally cannot find facts mm -hmm. because the information environment they're in is just poisoned by lies. We have to fix this problem and I, I just think that unless we get serious about that problem and fix it at the policy legal level we are not going to, again, risk communicate our way out of this. Yes, we have to do the generational work of teaching people how to, you know, vet information and decide if something's true or false and, and think critically about what they see online. But remember the earlier story I told about the high, former high ranking government official, if he couldn't, I'm, you know, our kids are smart, but like, let's be realistic about what we're asking people to do. It's incredibly difficult. So I think we need to get a lot more serious about that, that problem. Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, we in Brazil, we were victims of that. It's not, it was not only the, uh, um, I mean, maybe uh, kind of expected mismanagement due to the complexity of the situation. You know, one could expect some kind of difficulty uh, to, um, you know, make some decisions, but we suffered a deliberate action of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Um, from an industry that emerged from that moment. Uh, this, the gap between science and the daily basis of regular citizens was too wide and allowed um, people with not exactly the best interests of people in mind to occupy that place and manipulate people everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, um, it also came from our government. And that is something that uh, we have to deal as a global community 
because we are a globalized world and whatever happens in my country, for example, will affect here or whatever else uh, place in the world. So um, we are facing an electoral year in Brazil right now. Uh, pandemic has been a topic that has been brought in this sense among a lot of different things. Uh, we have been discussing leadership in this sense as well, but also community leadership in this because we failed to have a uh, national leadership that was competent enough to do with that. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to build competence from, um, uh, from bottom up. Uh, so I ask you, what do you think that beyond all of you, uh, beyond education, beyond uh, trying to reach people in a more uh, approachable way, uh, building this trust that we were talking about, um, how do you think that we can we can share this leadership in a way that we really change society. And then maybe for the next episodes that we know that we are going to happen, um, maybe have a different kind of performance. Hmm. Any? Well, I, I think it starts by not putting the entire weight of this problem on public health professionals or medical professionals and surely look, I'll speak for myself and not for anyone else in this room. I mean, I, I, I work in service to others, surely. And yet, it's I cannot solve this problem alone. This room cannot solve this problem alone, just, just like you were saying. So, you know, what is the opportunity or even the obligation of leaders uh, across sectors, across communities to take this on for themselves because it's affecting all of us so deeply. And we know that those roots really do run run deep and and so i you know when i was on the on the COVID board um, um during the transition after our last election here you know i remember being a part of conversations with industry with community leaders and other actors for this purpose right mm -hmm. um in an effort to to sort of share that burden and and uh, you know these leaders were willing and ready to to step into that i mean i don't think I don't think they have to be brought kicking and screaming into that role, especially given how it has affected um, people personally um, and professionally. Um, the other thing I'll say about this that I that I think is really important is we are just putting so much on the health profession right now and health professionals, mm -hmm. and we haven't talked about this um, so much yet. Um, but I but I don't want to miss making the point that we are it's more than burnout right it, it's just people are people are spent and it's and and it's scary i mean we're we're losing people from the profession but also people are losing their lives um and not to, to COVID directly but because it's just been a very 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 hard road um for a lot of people in this space and so i personally feel we owe it to everyone on the front lines even people behind the scenes to ensure they feel supported by other communities um, and by other leaders. And so I really appreciate this question. And I do think it's that's going to be important as we rebuild and recover that we are not just talking about the health workforce, but, you know, all of us who can, you know, come in around them um, with more than applause, right? Um, but with compensation and with breaks and with, you know, um, and with uh, just just some assurance that they're not going to be alone at this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? The microphone on the side, anyone has questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> anyone? Hi, um, thank you so much for this excellent, excellent panel. Uh, great to hear from y'all. Uh, I'm not a recent graduate, but I am a graduate. And my, my question to y'all is, um, each of you represent uh, 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 academic medical centers, universities, uh, HHS, and I would love to hear from you how much interaction all of your different you know, areas, uh, how much of interaction actually goes on and what ways could it be improved? Um, 
I think a fair amount. I think so too. I mean, we've, I've, uh, uh, we, we are here by, by circumstances of our, um, the, the recognition for our careers, which we're quite grateful for, but um, we all know each other and we have been working um, together at various points in this pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, a, a reflection of the work that these challenges require. And I think maybe just to piggyback on the earlier conversation, um, the earlier question about, um, you know, how we go forward, um, you know, I think a hallmark of pandemics, I mean, what pandemics are is, you know, they, they're not just a health crisis. When they happen, they touch not only all of public health, all of public health, it's not just about the virus, it's about all of the other progress that we make is at risk of, of um, backsliding and being interrupted. Um, but it also touches all of society. And we heard, you know, examples of it, including, you know, limited supply chains and, and, and other things. I mean, it really touches all of society. And so, first of all, if you're in your public health career and a pandemic hits, and I, you know, I, I thought about these issues before this pandemic, I taught about these issues. And the one thing, you know, I told all my students is, I don't expect you all to graduate from the school and to work on these issues, but at some point in your career in public health, you will work on these issues. And so we have to be aware of what they, that means for public health and society. And so when these events happen, um, first of all, I think it is critically important that we get um, a broad set of input into the path forward. Um, of course, medicine, public health, government, non-governmental, business, private sector. Um, but so many of the decisions are not strictly health decisions, right? We have to use the best available evidence, but there's a broad range of evidence that's necessary. And I really do think that we have to have broader input into our decision making and ideally in advance of a crisis into our plans. You know, I'm um, in addition to, you know, having worked on these issues, I'm also a mom. So I was feeling them firsthand, you know, when my kids were um, out of school, actually my daughter was able to go to daycare all year long, but my son wasn't able to go to school for a year. And so I was, you know, feeling the personal effects of, of a pandemic um, and, and seeing others in my community all feeling frustrated about the situation that we were in, but from very different political you know, perspectives. Um, but part of it, I think some of the frustration was also about our lack of inclusion in the decision making about what was happening. And some of it was poor operational decision making, um, not necessarily strategic decision making, but like, oh, we can't bring your kids back because we don't have enough space to, you know, enough place, a way to space them in the lunchroom. We don't have enough way to space them in during lunch. Well, you know, why can't you put them in the lunchroom? Well, that's where we're storing the chairs. You know, so I think, and it's not to fault the schools or anything like that. It's just to say that these challenges that we will face are incredibly hard and they require everyone to roll up their sleeves and pitch in and try to figure out what to help and to get people's, solicit people's viewpoints about what is the best path forward. I think in public health, we, we tend to have a view, but um, it's not always the right view. You know, I think I think in many, you know, we clearly have our reasons for it, but I think if we considered broader inputs, we might, you know, tweak that view a bit. So I, I think it's really important um, in, in all of this to recognize that, um, you know, through greater inclusion and engagement and, and soliciting of, of, of viewpoints and assistance um, that we hopefully will mount a stronger, hopefully more accepted, supported response than if we just try to you know, go in and in the midst of an emergency, it's really hard in the beginning, but these things are gonna happen again. So let's fix it in advance of the next one. And, and I could just add, I, I completely agree with what, what you said about the enormity of, of the issues. And even just within Johns Hopkins, I've experienced that because we were focused on patient safety and staff, clinical staff safety, um, but then immediately had to also deal with, grapple with issues about um, continuity of our research and who is going to take care of the um, the mice and the you know the the laboratory animals and and I know nothing about that so you know it it does require as you say soliciting stakeholder feedback so that you can even be aware of what people are experiencing what problems there are and then you know that was one of the heartwarming things was to see different people come from different parts of the organization in that case or from the community 
identifying those problems and then tackling them, making um, personal protective equipment, uh, you know, figuring out uh, how, how to care for the lab animals, things like that. And then I think on a hopeful note, I would say, uh, I would agree that there was an incredible amount of coordination um, uh, at all the different levels. Uh, but I also see that it's, it is much better. So I do agree to your earlier question that we have learned and um, and I really I don't know if you were on the call, but there was a call about monkeypox. So the White House, the CDC, FDA, Asper. It was this wonderful call last week um, with academic medical centers saying, "Okay, here's what we want to do for monkeypox. Here's what we need you to do. But we also need to hear from you. What barriers do you have to testing individuals? We want to increase testing to see if we're just detecting the tip of the iceberg." of the monkeypox that's out there and you know what are you experiencing and we had the opportunity to say well it's taking hours to test every patient exactly. because we have to get approval mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and so trying to you know and and i really am hopeful that those barriers are going to be addressed mm -hmm. and and then we were asked to develop in-house tests and it seemed like the fda was going to facilitate um, enabling us to do those tests which was a barrier um, mm -hmm. for covid so uh, I do think we can we can learn and get better. Um, so, yeah. Well, my country can definitely learn <laughs> and do better because <laughs> we didn't have nothing like that yet established, and we already had our first monkeypox case um, detected last week. So, I feel a bit sad with your answer. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? I just want to start. Thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. Um, you know, we we graduated in 2020, and I never thought when I signed up for a public health degree that it would be such a polarizing degree to get, or a polarizing role to play. Um, and I remember in 2020 January, we sat in Sheldon Hall and we looked at the map and we talked about our understanding of COVID then and how we didn't think it would necessarily cause a pandemic because of the wide asymptomatic burden. And I ask you this question, we've all had to pivot and, and answer to the public when our understanding of the disease has changed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we've talked a lot about building trust. Mm -hmm. And, and I, my question to all of you is, how do you maintain the trust you have with the public when you have had to go back on your words, change your understanding, and change public, the public's interpretation. I think you answered it partly by building coalitions so that everyone shares that risk. But in the absence of it, on the front line as an ER physician, people get really angry mm -hmm. when they trust you firsthand and you go back and you eat your words. So how do we build that trust when our understanding is always evolving? Well, I think it's being honest about that evolution and about those limitations. And I, I, I would say I, I've heard, um, you know, even going back to 2020, right, um, being in discussions with health professionals, with lay leaders, frankly, um, and really um, hearing people say and agreeing with the statement that you know, one of the ways we fell short was not being honest about our mm -hmm. own fallibility. And I think that's, that can be very hard and, and I'm not a medical doctor, right? But you know, I, I hear that's difficult in the medical profession, but I think it's also difficult in the public health profession because there's this, I think, sense or assumption by us, but also by the general public that the only way we can be trusted is if we're perfect or consider ourselves to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's not the way that our world works, right? And so where we missed the boat, and I think where we could try and correct the record is by really saying, look, there are many things that we know or that we believe that we know, and we're going to tell you what we think we know. Here's a sliver of space, right? And I don't know if or how we quantify that, where we still don't know some things, right? We, we, in, whether we're talking about COVID or monkeypox or the thing to come. But we feel very confident in these other areas, and here's why we feel confident, right? Here's all the data or the resources or whatever that make us assured in this big space. But there are still some question marks. We commit to coming back to you about those question marks, right? As they evolve, as we get answers, or as we have more questions, right? 
and we commit to listening to your questions and concerns about those answers, right, or about those lingering questions. But that's the dialogue, I think, was, is what was missing um, in this space. And you're right, it is hard to claw claw back. Um, but I, you know, people people want you to talk to them, right? I mean, <laughs> that's it, right? Like people just want you to talk to them and as the people that they are. Go ahead. And they need they need answers. Like I, I think sometimes when you don't fully know, there's you don't maybe, say there's maybe a hesitation to be like, well, we can't say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, people have to make decisions to live their lives. So yeah. we have to make we have to give them our best judgment with all the qualifications. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a really tangible, tangible answer to your question, which is um, it completely threw me by surprise, but um, I'm very active on Twitter. I think it's a very, it's a sad state of affairs, but I think it's an important policy lever for better or for worse. I actually think for worse, but nonetheless, you can make change on Twitter, um, also through the media. So um, to this day, I think still, in probably the thousands of tweets over this uh, pandemic, the one that has gotten the most attention mm. of mine is one in which I admitted that I was incorrect about something, mm. that I had thought something was going to happen. It didn't happen. And I went back and said, I was worried about this. It turned out not to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Glad I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I had no, no idea the amount of like response I would get mm -hmm. from that. Um, the New York Times covered it <laughs> as like a thing that like scientists admits mistake. Um, it was a very proud moment, I guess, that <laughs> they are covering my mistake. Um, but it made me really, really sad that yeah. it was even a thing yeah. that like that is apparently yeah. not common. Yeah. Um, so admit your mistakes, it'll, you know, boost your career, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what to say um, other than uh, don't, don't stop answering, but, you know, explain, give an answer and give your explanation for why you're giving that answer. And if you're wrong, follow up. And I think that explanation for how you came to it mm -hmm. and, and sharing the data and something about the decision-making process, because a lot of the anger that I yeah. have had directed towards our team, I think is about, they want more and more transparency about how decisions are being made. They'd like to, you know, ultimately have a voice. They want to feel heard. Um, and much like convincing people to get vaccinated, unfortunately, the only thing I've really found is having one-on-one -on -one conversations, which is incredibly difficult when you're, you know, so overwhelmed, but but that can make a tremendous difference. Um, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations and talking about the decision-making process, what you do know, what you don't know, and, and listening <laughs> and, and acknowledging the frustrations and anger and fear that people feel and kind of talking through that. And, and sometimes it leads to a change. Often it, it can't, but at least maybe they walk away understanding that you've listened mm -hmm. and why it, it has to be the way that it is. Um, and if I may compliment that, I think that we have never been under such public eye scrutiny. Um, so being transparent and also focusing in, in uh, focusing on tangibility, what is actually useful for your patient on that day, because that body of knowledge, it grows immensely from day to day. Yeah. So when you build this, uh, this foundation with a patient, you can grow from there. Uh, instead of trying to answer everything that we don't know, maybe focus on exactly what you can answer and tell them exactly what they say. Like, if we have more uh, knowledge on that, I will share that with you, but at, for now. So for example, one of the, the uh, most, uh, um, uh, one of the many questions that I actually received this entire time in Brazil uh, was not exactly what I wanted to say, to answer, but it was what people wanted me to answer. And it was, do I need to wash my hair when I come back from work? every single day. It, it, seems for, it seems to us to be a nonsense question in a way that, you know, this is not about the pandemic itself, but that was something that was building the trust for that person because that person needed that to feel safer. Um, so from that on, we could grow, you know, this kind of relationship and that was easier to deal with. At least in our situation there, I think it really helped. Please. Yes, so we have a question online that says, is there a project at Johns Hopkins for the education of critical thinking in relation to public health aimed at elementary and high schools? 
You're looking at me, Lisa. Because <laughs> you're the only one still here. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm going to admit that I do not know the answer to that. Um, but I think it's a, an outstanding idea and something that I think fits with what we're talking about here. So um, I, I think it's an outstanding question, something we need to think about. Um, building that level of trust and um, literacy mm -hmm. for these kinds of concepts and ideas um, from the earliest ages. So, mm -hmm. great suggestion. And great opportunity for partnership, right, mm -hmm. with right. the community and you know, with, with another sector, the education sector. Right. Um, I wanted to add, actually, my daughter is in through fifth grade, and she's in the Um, she explained what she was doing at the at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She broke it down to a middle school to high school level. I have actually used that video and shared it with friends of mine who work in traditional health administration, so they're not as into the clinical world. And it's really been helped with a lot of light bulbs. So if you wanted to, it is posted on YouTube. Um, if you just you know do a general search for it, I'm sure you'll find it. It is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think that unfortunately our time is over. Um, I cannot say, I cannot express enough how happy and honored I am to be here with all of you. You are inspirational and uh, I'm also really happy to be back here and also be inspired by my great, great colleagues from the MPH cohort 2020. Um, I'm happy and I am honored and I think that this refills us all to keep fighting for the right thing. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you all that were at home or you know, remotely uh, following this session. Muito obrigada a todo mundo de, do Brasil que estava assistindo. Agradeço muito. And I think that uh, this is it. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.